This is Rudo Radio coming to you from the 559. Hello and welcome to Rudo Radio, SB Nation and Cage Side Seats weekly wrestling podcast. I am joined as ever by Mr. Mark Normandit. Mark, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I pronounced Cage Side Seats correctly, but I forgot my name this time. So I thought you forgot how often the podcast ran. <laughs> no, I had to think after. I said cage side seats, whether or not I had pronounced it correctly. So, oh, okay. so that's what the, that's what this week's pause was about. <laughs> well, I'm glad you recognized your faults. Uh, I'm, that's, I see them. I recognize implies like an understanding and an ability to see going forward. And I, I just don't. I don't. I assume that's not going to happen. Uh, pretty good weekend or week, I guess, of wrestling. It feels yeah. like a five day weekend every single time. No, uh, no. It uh, it was a good it was a good elimination chamber, but not a great one. Uh, both in terms of the match and the show. Uh, we talked about it before the the show that you thought it was uh, maybe the worst of the brand extension post brand extension post draft pay per views. Is that an accurate you are, assessment? You are putting too many hyphens in that shit. Just. <laughs> It's the worst SmackDown pay-per-view so far. It's the worst pay-per-view. So that's it. You don't think it's the worst brand extension. You just think it's the worst SmackDown one. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't It wasn't bad either. You know, the, the, the SmackDown ones so far that have had problems have been like, oh, that was an okay show. This show as a whole, probably below average, but the, the second half of the card really lifted it up, I thought. Uh, it's just kind of like it started out solid and then fell into depths that the rest of the show had to lift it out of so well that is a really nice way to put how bad that tag team tor- turmoil match was <laughs> how pointless was that like american alpha we already know you're the best you are the champions okay so why not have a match that a shows that there was no competition for you in the entire division and so- also doesn't introduce new competition or, yeah, like, if the Revival comes out at the end, thank God, that's awesome. But... Yeah. Or have, like, what the Usos did matter? You know, because they attack... At all whatsoever. Yeah, they attack American Alpha, and then, like, then shouldn't the Ascension come in and do their finisher and win? Like, that's it. So then you've got this beef going forward, and maybe some interesting kind of, like, three-team match you can do later on, and you, you prop up a team and show, like, the Usos are a threat, and then, hey, maybe have the Ascension win some matches once they have the belts. And it's like, oh, shit. There are, you know, there's more than one team on this show whose role is to do something other than eat a pin. Because that's really the issue with, with SmackDown's tag division, is pretty much everyone right now is designed to eat a pin, except for American Alpha. So what, like, what... And it doesn't have to be that way. That's what's really aggravating. Like, I don't understand why we can be really entertained by Tyler Breeze and Fandango, but they're not allowed to also be good at wrestling. Especially when we know that they're both good at wrestling, especially Tyler Breeze. Like, how come they can't win and be funny? How come Ascension, you can't try and build them up as scary by letting them be something other than, like, looking scary? Like, let them win some matches and be a real threat. Let the Usos do something besides just post-match attacks. There's already so much talent on that show, but you treat all of them like jobbers except for Alpha. And it's... And you don't even treat them, like, super great. Well, they can't look great because you've essentially said everyone they face is garbage. So, here, get excited for this match. The real... This is an insane sentence to say. I feel like the real money match would be... I... Again, I can't believe I'm saying this. Heath Slater and Rhino versus American Alpha. That'd like, be great. I, I think that would be the best possible matchup they would have right now because I you could even just have it be like a who's the best tag team 
feud, not, uh, oh, the, they yeah. turned heel against them. Like, both teams are super over. Both teams, people would be excited to see. And here's a secret. Heath Slater and Rhino are a really good tag team. They yeah. work really well. Like, Heath Slater is great. And I think he'd help out American Alpha a lot. He'd make them look great. Rhino is a good veteran. Like, they, that should be with a feud. I understand why it's not. I understand why it's probably going to be the Usos and the Ascension versus American Alpha. But it's not going to be that good of a match. I, which sucks, because American Alpha it should be having really good matches. And they're, there's just no competition Ugh. It's another reason I was talking about doing the SmackDown Tag Champs versus the Raw Tag Champs just for bragging rights at Mania. Because there's there is no one they have built up in that division worthy of facing American Alpha at Mania. And it's just a waste of time to do it. So if you have Raw Tag Champs that seem legitimate against SmackDown ones just to, just to do that, to put it on the pre-show or something, that's, that's a good use of those people. Because otherwise you're just throwing everyone in the dray and... You know they're just going to get tossed out or whatever, unless it's like Jason Jordan, and you want to have him toss some people out first. I also have another complaint about that tag match. Not to harp, harp on it too long, but why did American Alpha come in like third to last on a match where they're defending their titles, and they're the ones who were like, "We could beat everybody all at once at the same time. We're so good." Put them in first. Let them lose after beating like four teams. So then you are like, "Oh, they beat four teams because they're great. They're the champions." But also, wow. They really kind of overestimated both themselves and everyone that was facing them. You have a situation where, you know, they, they beat the Usos, and then the Usos beat them down, and then American Alpha is pinned because, hey, they've already beaten three or four teams, and they've been in this match for so long, and also they just got beat down, and then someone comes in, takes advantage of it, and you're like, oh shit, there's going to be new champions, who's left? Know, or just, just ha have it exactly what you did, except to have American Alpha come in first instead of fourth, and have the Usos be the second to last team, and have uh, or uh, have like switch it so they're the sixth, and then the seventh team is the Ascension, like basic, and have them actually lose. Instead, you're like, oh, they kind of hurt them, but not too bad. It'll be okay. Instead of like, wow, they should be really pissed at the Usos that cost them the title. They're like, man, can you believe what those jerks did? Like, that's the reaction they can have. Yeah, it's it's just it was really poorly booked, and I thought it was the the match said it's most entertaining when Heath Slater and Rhino were going crazy. And after that, like, because they were, like, that was a good, fast-paced tag match. And then everything just kind of slowed down and fell apart. And, you know, any interest that picked up after the Usos beat down of American Alpha went away when it was like, why didn't the Ascension just pin them, like, now? And then you throw in that that was, what, the third post-match beatdown of four they did on the show? Yeah, I believe so. That sounds about right. Like, yeah, no, they had three. It was a second of three, I believe, because they had it in the, uh, which was my next question. Was this match better or worse than the handicap match where Cruz and Kalisto beat Dolph Ziggler, but Dolph Ziggler made look like them look like the biggest jobbers in the history of mankind? It was better than that, but only because that was like useless from start to finish. Like it was, it was a good idea to start with Dolph attacking Kalisto and everything went downhill from there. Like he made Apollo Cruz look like a chump. Which I don't. Are you trying to build up Apollo Cruz? Is that is that your goal? I mean, it doesn't. Nothing that WWE has done since bringing Apollo Cruz up is like aligned with making him a bigger deal, or having character or depth or letting anyone care about him. But you know, minor things. Yeah, and then Kalisto comes back and they win the match and all that's great. But then Ziggler like threatens to break his ankle with the chair, and the crowd is like, "Thank you, Ziggler. We don't know who this person is and have no emotional attachment to him." I, I, it's crazy that we're at a point where I'm like. They should just send Apollo Crews back down to NXT, because it's not working. I don't care how much of a look he has. I know he's super talented, but they're not letting him show it, and nobody gives a shit about him. Like, So you didn't like the match, is what you're saying? No, it was awful, and it just made no sense. And like, The best evidence they have of them just completely, royally fucking up Apollo Crews is Dolph Ziggler as a heel trying to break his ankle, and everyone's like, that's good. I like the direction that this is heading in. I want to see this man's ankle brutally just just, just destroyed. I want it in pieces. Then he won't be on my television anymore. Like, just send him down to NXT and give him time to work shit out. Like, getting sent down to NXT and having making that a story point would finally get people behind him and give people a reason to think about him. 
because it's like, well, you know, they called me up and then they didn't use me right and like I'm pissed off. And instead of going on the indies and complaining about that, let them go through NXT and have this extra edge and ferocity and just intensity and go with that. And then people will see him like rising back and they'll blame WWE instead of him and all of his success will be in spite of them for whatever reason, you know, even though they're all pulling the strings and shit. Like they get, they get to do something because. Do you, with the way he's been treated, you would think he was on Raw. It's like, that's that's how serious about this I am. Because man, he's just lost in the shuffle. I I just hated the match from beginning to end. <laughs> I I hate Dolph Ziggler. So I like he annoys me. Like I, he's just someone I don't like watching. And his promo during SmackDown, uh, SmackDown Raw, SmackDown Live was so swar- smarmy in a way that wasn't even fun or engaging. It was just, I, I just don't like him. I don't like the character that he's playing as like, I'm not interested in it. I just wanted to not be on my TV. And he touches his face too much. That's another thing I don't like. He reminds me of the kid Mitch. From Dazed and Confused, where they have that drinking game that you're supposed to drink every time Mitch touches his face, but if you do, you die, because he constantly touches his face. Dolph Ziggler was doing that every every sentence. He was, like, putting his hand on his chin, or, like, giving the, like, thumb on the... I, he's just such a douchebag. I hate him so much. You know what, Nick? I think we need to talk about something that we like. I There's nothing I like. God not about the match. Fuck that match. It sucked. Let's talk about <laughs> something that's not that match. Uh, the annoying double countout that they had between Nikki and Natalia. Okay, you know, is that what you want to talk about? That annoyed me at the time for obvious reasons, such as why isn't this feud over? But like, I like where it went. I like how it like retroactively is now fine because of what happened on SmackDown where Nikki and Natalia start going at it again backstage for sniping at each other and then hitting each other. And Daniel Bryan is finally like, <laughs> they made Daniel Bryan angry with yelling. Daniel Bryan doesn't yell, and at the end he's just like Jesus, and walks away. So yeah, him saying Jesus was <laughs> another great Daniel Bryan moment. <laughs> Jesus, <Yeah. laughs> I I don't know if you've seen the Bella Brains uh, videos. They are they try to has, they try to define spell and use hyperbole in a sentence. Mm-hmm. It's it's horrifying. <laughs> Though Brie does, by accident, complete accident, because she thinks the word has to do with boiling at a very high temperature. Oh my god. It, she spells hyperbole right. But then, because she knows how the word is spelled, she tries to use it in a sentence, and it just does not. Because <laughs> she thought it looked completely different. And then she found out it was spelled that way, and she's like, ah, oh, shit, now I have no clue how to use that word. <laughs> Daniel Bryan's been just 18 different types of wonderful through all of this. I also like that, although it is total bullshit, the one, like, saving grace that Daniel Bryan has as a heel to the heels is that he is Nikki's brother-in-law. So they can actually, like, Maurice is going to bring that up. Oh, yeah. And I think that's, like, a really good hook because it's just, like, logical enough if you don't know anything else to be like yeah they're kind of right and it's like no he's totally not handing her anything Mm -hmm. like at all but i think it's a good thing to bring up to like needle him and i just really like what they've done with him in terms of the ability to make him someone who does things but doesn't take over the entire show well it's like um this is kind of an opposite of mcfoley moment where uh, James Ellsworth and Dean Ambrose were backstage, and oh my god, I Dean's love like, that. Dean's like Daniel. Is there any chance that I can just beat the shit out of this guy? And Daniel doesn't just automatically go, "Yeah, you're a good guy. Of course you can." He goes, "Well, you know, he did screw you over, and you never did get to get to do anything about that." Yeah, go ahead, fuck him up in a and section he, match. Yeah, and he does the same thing with Nikki and Natalia. He explains in detail without it being feeling like exposition, just being like. Yeah, we've tried all of these things, and you're just not listening, so this is what we're going to do. Yeah, we're going to do a false count anywhere, because you idiots keep fighting everywhere. So, it's whatever. Like in the ring, so just fight wherever, we don't care. Yeah, just, this is it, though. That's fine. And that's good. That's why I'm retroactively okay about the double count out, because... 
Elimination Chamber is happening, what? It happened, what, seven weeks before WrestleMania? You've got time to fill. You don't have to f- conclude every feud at Elimination Chamber. So, they're clearly already working toward the next thing with Nikki. False Count Anywhere has a pretty good sense of finality to it. Cool. Cool. They're just, it's like, it gives us something to care about next week. Good. I'm happy. Was that Nikki match, the Nikki Natalia match, the worst of the three matches on the card for the woman, or? I think it was the worst. I don't, I think it was too long, but I don't yes. think it was bad. It's one of those matches where if you edited five minutes out of it, we would have been like, oh, that was pretty good. Because there were a lot of really good moments and intensity, and I think Nikki did a good job of being like, Natalia, I know you were trained in the dungeon, but also I know how to wrestle. Sharpshooter! <laughs> so, yeah, it's one of those, if you, had, if you had just cut out some of the bits and made it end a little sooner. Uh, and the double count out made that hard, too, where it's like, dude, you guys just wrestled for 15 minutes and then a double count out. It's easier to take if they wrestled for 10. Um, or if the double count out had happened because they were both in the crowd, you know, and the ref was just like, oh, God, these people, whatever. Yeah, not it, like if you can see the person, you shouldn't count them like <laughs> You can you should have a lot more leeway than all right. That was actually it was like nine and a half. But we're gonna call it. They were like, no, 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 it's good. It's a count out. And they should have just had them go out in the crowd or yeah. like go past where it opens up. I know that sounds like a silly yeah. distinction, but if you are still like in the line of sight of the ref, he should try to get you back in the ring. And Nikki was trying to get back in the ring. I do appreciate that. That Natalia was just like, shit, I'm a little slower than Nikki, and she got there first. Yoink. <laughs> it's like no we both lose so I don't, like it was fine it just, I thought it was oh. a little too long and the, the Becky Mickey match was, was solid it's um it's nice to see Becky wrestle someone and I don't mean this is disparaging to the rest of the division but it's nice to see Becky wrestle someone who is considered to be on her level not someone she is bringing up by wrestling her um cause it helps with the whole like Becky is so overpowered sometimes that it's like, oh, it's not someone she can just slap like a disarmor on immediately. Yeah, she's a, a championship, a blue chip championship level talent. Like yeah. she, like Becky, is a f- definite, at least for Mickey, probably for Becky, a, a future Hall of Famer. Like yeah. Alexa might end up being that, but there's no guarantee in the way that like Becky is pretty much unless something goes terribly wrong it'll be like a two to five time women's champion and mickey james is already a five-time women's champion like that's different than alexa i mean you think of the way they had alexa win the title and then defend it against becky was gimmick match where she didn't need to pin her she just pushed it through a table which is which fine is, not, not and it is like a notorious it, but... tool they use yeah. to yeah give championships to people who deserve it, but wouldn't be believable necessarily beating the person that they beat. And then have her defend it with the help of Mickey James dressed up in a mask and all their shenanigans, you know, things like that. Like Becky straight up one-on-one with Alexa has won every time. And that, that that's the way it should be. Alexa should be better than 95% of the roster, but there should be that good guy lurking in the wings who can beat her. And that's, that's Becky, and, that, and that's fine, but it's just, it's good to see Becky wrestle someone. Because she hasn't had to face, like, Nikki, or, you know, didn't get, like, an extended Natalia run or anything. Anyone who's, like, already believably at the level of, like, oh, this could be trouble. Was it better, was the Becky-Mickey match, I say that five times fast, better than the championship match? I was really, I liked the championship match as, I, I don't know how to as like a thing unto itself, like I was really happy for Naomi and I thought it was a good match. And because it was a championship match in which Naomi won her title unexpectedly, it made it a better match. But I feel like Becky Mickey was actually the like technically better match. Does that make sense? Uh, it makes sense. Uh, it's a fine line. I, I like the championship match a little better, but like it's if you start to nitpick exactly why, you know, you start to get into really, I don't know, not tenuous reasoning, but like, they're close. They're so close. I oh think... no, no, that's what I'm saying. Is it was like yeah. they're in ter- they were one and one a in terms of like yeah. I didn't think there was a discernible difference between the two. But I think if I were to like look back, the Naomi Alexa match was a really good match because Naomi won the title, and I was really happy about that. Like I went home happy from that match because Naomi won. I thought it was a good match otherwise, but I, I didn't think it was like exceptionally better than Becky Mickey. But that means I'd be really excited to watch Becky. 
and <clears throat> Becky and Naomi versus Mickey and Alexa if they do that, choose to do that at WrestleMania. Oh, for God, I don't want a tag match. I'm happy with them getting on the card. I oh, no, don't... Fatal 4-Way. Treat it seriously. Do I, a Fatal 4-Way with those if ladies. If they do that, awesome. My problem is you don't want a Fatal 4-Way and a triple threat match for the title. And that feels like where they're going on Raw, which we'll get to later, but... I mean, what they should do is a ladder match with the women's division for the championship at Mania and put oh, it on the yeah. actual card. Like, that's the thing you should absolutely do. Um, and, I don't know, have even Marie come out from the back randomly and just take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's like, I think of it this way. How, what, what SmackDown matches are going to be on the Mania card? Uh, Bray, Luke, and... I mean, hopefully Bray, Luke, and Randy, but before we even get into that, like, you're going to have the World Heavyweight the world heavyweight Championship match. I mean, the World Championship match. What else? You had supposedly Cena and Nikki Belly, Nick, uh, Nikki Belly, uh, Nikki Bella in the mixed tag against Miz and Maurice. Okay. <laughs> so you've got two of your biggest, like, not two of your biggest stars, but you get three of your bigger stars in a mixed tag match. From yeah, so I guess you don't probably want to have another tag match. You don't want to have like... another tag, especially when it'll be a pre-show tag match. Because, like, what, what's going on? The Intercontinental title might not be on the main card if it's even there at all. Unless they do Baron. If they do Baron Dean, I feel like it will, but it'll be like a curtain jerker match. Yeah, but, like, SmackDown feels like it's getting the shaft here. So that's why I really want this, like, a, a ladder match or let them do the four-way. Because... Man, give them give them something important. You, you just create this cycle where you're like, well, the, SmackDown doesn't get it because they don't have the stars. And you're like, well, they don't have the stars because you never feature them. And they're like, yeah, but when they have stars, we'll feature them. <sighs> eh. Just fucking show them on your show. You all right? You... No, I am not all right. No, I'm fine. Yeah, it's, just, I... that, it's, just, it's, just, it's just aggravating. It's very aggravating. They should be more famous. I don't... <laughs> uh, it's just I don't know it's just frustrating that they really treat Smackdown like a B show and then it goes against the whole thing where they're talking about how like Smackdown vs. Raw and all that anyway yeah I I get the feeling sometimes they also I don't know how to put this without sounding conspir- conspiratorial but I feel like they also do stuff in terms of leak things and messaging and the way they advertise things to make people feel like SmackDown is the underdog. Like, they literally talked about that when they were first doing the brand split of, like, that's the way they were going to frame the show. Mm -hmm. And I I feel like more and more they're doing stuff like having Mick Foley be like, oh, well, if you were three hours, it's like, no. Like you said in in Rude Awakening. Oh, God, yeah, let's talk about that. Like, no, if it were three hours, they would do a better job than you assholes do. (laughs) And... And here's the thing, and, and this is important. This is something I realized. Well, let's um, let's give people background on that because they might not know what we're referring to here. So Mick Foley uh, was doing an interview. Is that correct? Or it was a, it was an interview, not a post on Facebook, or was it a post on Facebook? I think it was it was an interview. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he basically said, "Oh well, you know, it's an internet darling show because it's a two hour show. If it, they had to add a third hour, it wouldn't be as popular or as beloved by people." who are on the internet. It was basically like it's an internet show which which has a huge advantage over our show, but it's not actually better. It just has a way lower threshold, like a way lower degree of difficulty. And as everyone knows, 205 Live at an hour is the best show that is the most well-regarded that WWE has. So, and man. There, <sighs> and the problem is, is he was conflating... People, like, the thing with SmackDown that makes it better than Raw is the show about, and I swear to God this is true, fucking wrestlers being wrestlers and doing wrestling things. It's super, and pardon my French, fucking weird, but that's that works. It works. Instead of just being like, I love Stephanie. You love Stephanie. We all love Stephanie. But that show is an ego trip for her and the people that are important to her. More than it is a wrestling show at this point. And I understand, and I don't mean that in the sense that Stephanie McMahon, the human being, is doing this. But the actual structure of the show is that Stephanie is a monster who makes the show all about herself. 
And now her husband, fellow monster, is back and brought a monster with him to do his dirty work, which is another thing. And, like, I love Samoa Joe being back, but that show revolves around the McMahons. Yes, it's the McMahon show. It's not the SmackDown show. And it's... Uh, or the Raw show, rather. I just can't believe that they're saying... Like, Mick is saying Raw is worse than or less liked than SmackDown because it's three hours long. No, it's because it's three hours of shit when it's bad. Because yeah. Raw is bad, it is terrible, and it is forever taking. And you can't... You've got three hours and you can't find time to properly put the cruiserweights over? These people are super talented. Oh, I'm sorry. The Cruiserweight Classic was in one-hour bits. That must be it. You've, yeah, you've, I... You've got, how many women are in the division on Raw? That was my favorite point you made, was that you don't use the entire roster of women you have on the show, and you have an extra hour to do it. You're just not... You're not... The show isn't about wrestling. It's about dudes and... Girl, like, it's like people trying to be cool. That's what, you know why the women's division works so well? Because it's about people wanting to be the best person on the show. <laughs> That's why the women's division on Raw, what they use of it, is so good. It's of because course, it's now, just... it's, now it's dealing with Stephanie. Because, like, even Bailey is name-dropping Stephanie in promos, and Stephanie's all like, I'm the boss, Sasha. Yeah, she's going to take the title next week because Sasha hit uh, Charlotte in, in the, the sternum. <laughs> right in the boob and they wanted to say it and they couldn't she had her it was a perfect shot <laughs> I know I, oh, yeah, I, just I, at the same time said the exact same thing about that when it oh, ah. for a one week spot <laughs> yeah that was a, and that was a great match and we'll definitely talk about it later but like that trend, they're gonna start you can sense it like you said they're name dropping Stephanie it's like I don't want this this is the one thing that isn't about Stephanie totally Oh, she'll make it about Stephanie. And I, again, we love, you and I love Stephanie. It's just, like, the show can't just be about her. Damn it, they're going to try. Anyway, let's get back to, we didn't finish Elimination Chamber. What no, are, we didn't. What are other things we like? Hey, Randy Orton had a really good match at Elimination Chamber, which I am mildly surprised about, but you know what? That's because Luke Harper is the man. Uh, I was actually going to say, Luke Harper had a good match, and Randy Orton was in the ring for it. Uh, well, you know. I, you know, I like Randy, not as much as you. Oh, but I, yeah, and Randy is number one in my heart and my mind. But the last great Randy Orton match was Daniel Bryan centric. Seth, I oh, think, oh, think Seth right. at WrestleMania. I mean, that was a good match too. It was a good match with a with like awesome finish, spectacular and beautiful. Yeah. Uh, they did a comic, but the most recent WWE comic book has it. They do like a a full page panel of all of that match. It's really good. <laughs> but yeah, this is the best Orton match in at least a couple years, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it makes sense. You're dealing with a guy who's, like, a, a really gr a great talent. Like, not just good, a great talent. Is his character there? Maybe not necessarily uh, in terms of his promos and stuff like that. But in the ring, he is a, he's a top-notch, top-class performer. And Randy or he got Randy Orton excited about wrestling again, it seemed. <laughs> Which, man, it's great. And it tied into, I mean, you can talk about the Elimination Chamber match in detail after, but, um, you know, Bray won. Bray Wyatt won. Spoilers. Sorry, everyone. And then on Tuesday, he defended successfully against AJ Styles and John Cena, which brought out Randy Orton. And Orton says, hey, as long as you're the master and I'm the servant, I'm not going to use my Royal Rumble privileges against you, which is fascinating. Um, even more fascinating because Luke Harper reminded Bray that just because he's champion doesn't mean that their business is settled. Because he kicked Bray Wyatt in the face before his match against Styles and Cena. Uh, I love, I love that he uh, like the part where the refs are all surrounding him and he just sticks his hands in the air. Yeah. He's, like, he's like, "I'm done. Take me away, officers." <laughs> I did yeah, what he, I had to do. I would be really excited. Uh, and you, you've you wrote about this for Rude Awakening. Um, the a triple threat between Bray, Randy, and Luke would be the perfect way to do this. <sighs> It'd be it separates it from the universal title match, but makes it a big deal. It allows you to get both Bray and Luke over in a re what's going to probably be a great match. Yeah, because I see, like Bray versus Luke would be great. Bray versus uh, Bray versus Randy, I'm sure it would be better. 
than the last time they wrestled each other. I don't think it's WrestleMania quality, most likely. Uh, not like, for a main, not for a main event where yeah. it's one of the top three or four matches. So, man, putting Luke in there and like, triple threats just move so effectively and so well. Uh, because you can kind of transition from one thing to another, and before something gets stale, you can move on to something different. Um, plus, there's a lot of stories involved there. Like, Randy doesn't want to face Bray, but if Luke is involved in the match, and Luke would have to be involved in the match by winning the Battle Royal that Daniel Bryan set up for next episode of SmackDown. Yeah, and he's the only person that makes sense to win, which I yeah. like, but but not in a way that's obvious, in a way that you really have to think about, and you go, oh, he's, oh, he's probably going to win, just because nobody else would make sense in that spot, but it's a perfect spot for him at the same time. Like, he belongs there, and it makes sense for him storyline-wise. And everyone else who is in the Elimination Chamber match, for instance, who could win, is going to have something else that probably keeps him from winning that Battle Royal. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. It's like, there's nobody else that's really on that list where you're like, oh... They should they could totally they should totally win it because that would be an interesting storyline. But it's not obvious because they could always have John Cena win. They won't. Yeah, but they could always have John. But Cena. this I feel like this is a good like um like an Aztec warfare moment for them. Yes, where they can spin out the next like five six weeks of stories leading to Mania by in this battle royal. You can have Miz and John Cena really interact. You can have Corbin and Dean screw each other up, keep them from being in there again. It gives Corbin even more reason to hate Dean and Dean even more reason to hate Corbin. Styles can be screwed one way or another. Um, like if they have Shane, I know we don't want to go this direction, but hey, reality. If like Shane doesn't have him in the match because he just had a bunch of title shots or whatever, and like it's time for an opportunity for other people or somebody who gets eliminated eliminates him. <laughs> yeah, so just something. Uh, to something survive. where it's like a grave miscarriage of justice. <laughs> but it's such, such opportunity. And I can see Luke Harper winning it and then Randy Orton going, wait a second. No, no, I want to be in this match now. And then it becomes a whole thing about like, well, you can't be in the match unless you defeat, I don't know, whatever. Like you win the, some other match, you know? Uh, which gives Randy something to do. And then all of a sudden, Bray Wyatt's realizing, like, oh, shit, I'm going to face Luke Harper at WrestleMania. And we've got that interplay where Luke can really come into his own as a character, as an, a, a force opposite of Bray Wyatt. And if you have all three of them in Mania together, you've got a face in there, first of all. Because Bray is kind of chaotic neutral. Uh, Randy is a heel unless he's about to do an RKO. And you know you need, you need this, like, stabilizing force in there. And, and Luke's a... Huge, weird baby face. And yeah, people are people really are pushing for him. And he's been doing great stuff that has been given the opportunity. Well, it's, it's one of those things where they never... And th this is when protecting somebody, as it were, is good. Where they like let you see bits and pieces of them throughout their career. So when you finally want to push them, it's not like, oh, we've seen a six foot nine guy do a hurricanrana a bunch of times. It's like, holy crap, that six foot nine guy did a hurricanrana. He's done it before, but, like, this is against Randy Orton. Or, like, the crazy stuff that Luke can do, the uh, the Tope Atomica and stuff mm -hmm. like that, like, that stuff really works to make him a main eventer because guys his size just don't do that stuff. And they had it so he was familiar, but not so familiar that people were tired of him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like the Braun Strowman dropkick thing. <laughs> that looks... Like, Braun Strowman threw a dropkick against Mark Henry, and you're like, wait, I thought this was a test of strength. He can also do that. And you've seen him do it before. But it's just that reminder in that context of, like, yes. oh, shit. Mark Henry's huge, and he can do that. Mark Henry can't do that. Oh, Braun Strowman's better than Mark Henry. You know, it really feeds into what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about that match in a little bit. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> Here's, I guess, my final question about both Elimination Chamber and, and SmackDown. Did they do the right thing? Are they doing the right thing with, and doing right by everybody that was in Elimination Chamber? Or do you think, like, AJ is getting a short, the short, stinky end of the stick? I think AJ Styles just had one of the best debut years in the history of WWE. And I don't think it's a terrible thing if we have to wait a little bit for him to be back in the title picture. He's really the only one I can see real, like, short shrift for. And it's not... It's excusable. I th like, he's been in the title picture or had the title since um, right around SummerSlam time. So, like, as long as SmackDown has been split, he's been champion or 
uh, pretty much, you know, because he won it from Dean, like, immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's been in the title picture the entire time. He's been one of the main stars of the show. You can kind of lower, his, like, not even lower his prominence, but, like, shift it away from the title scene. Because it's also the, uh, the like, monster. In t- he's the best wrestler. So he should win almost every match he's in because yeah. he's so the best wrestler. So if you move him away from the... T- in other words, like, if he gets five title shots, it's not going to take him five title shots to win the title first. Yes. Yeah. Right, it's going to take him two. He's going to figure it out. So you have to get him away from the title picture for however long. It's like, um, this isn't a perfect analog, obviously, but uh, it's like when CM Punk lost to Cena on that Raw, and you know he couldn't take that like he couldn't take that rematch against The Rock for Mania twenty nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then they shifted him to Undertaker immediately. Like that's kind of what you did. He just yes. lost this triple threat. Find something else that. Even though we don't give a shit about him versus Shane McMahon, someone out there does. Someone somewhere does. People love Shane. They love Shane. And they're going to watch him die in a ring someday, and I, it's going to be terrible for everyone. But, I don't know, they want to see it, I guess. <laughs> you monsters. You monsters. Yeah, the Elimination Chamber also uh, used the chamber itself as a really good stage for what they were doing. Uh, both basically throughout the entire match from Baron destroying Dean and throwing him through the, the bulletproof glass to everybody jumping off. Even the camera shots were awesome. I really liked the new and improved elimination chamber. Uh, I did not like the floor, however. Yeah, it feels, I mean, it feels kind of cop when they're like, 10 tons of steel, and like now it's clearly not because the floor is not steel, or maybe it's steel underneath all the padding. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, hey, maybe people will be more willing to do entertaining things in the Elimination Chamber because they're not going to die via floor. Because, man, remember the last, like the previous Elimination Chamber match that was just god awful and kind of made you go, you know, maybe it's okay they're not doing this anymore. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, when was that when Mark Henry got locked in the, the pod and they had to like they had a vamp for like five minutes <laughs> and they had Kalisto like fall off the roof onto everybody. Um, <laughs> and you're just kind of like, well, they're out of ideas because that seemed like it was going to be cool, but really wasn't that cool. So I don't know. I'm kind of I'm like kind of okay with them being like, okay, fine. Dean. Dean Ambrose being like, I will totally jump off of this thing like 17 times. I just don't want to land on steel. And they're yeah. like, that's fair. Okay. I uh, also liked, like I said, the way that it's now made to be shot into with camera, like camera wise. Yeah. And it looks way better that way. It's less like I am watching this through a fence from far away. Yes. Or way too close to the action because you also have the guys in there with them. Bless the like one they're... cameraman who is <laughs> inside the chamber. Yeah, um, and I really liked how they used it. And some year, some matches, elimination chamber matches, do this better than others. Uh, but I thought the storyline weaving in and out was really well done. Mm-hmm. Like they had the way they had, like I said, Baron just destroy Dean was fantastic. The way that they had Bray beat both John and AJ. Yes, and, so and the way that, and the way even the way they had Baron destroy. Ambrose, and then, and my dad was amazed that I could predict this. Uh, he did not expect. He was like, "Oh well, who's gonna? What's gonna happen with Dean Ambrose now?" And I was like, "Oh, the Miz is gonna pin him." He's like, "What? No." I was like, "Yeah, no, it's the Miz's thing. It's like the most Miz thing you could possibly do." <laughs> and like the thing opens, and Miz just is like, "Oh, I'm totally gonna pin that guy." And he like starts walking, and then he runs. It was just the most beautiful Miz thing in the history of mankind. And my dad thought I was a genius, and it's like, no, I've seen more than one Miz segment. <laughs> like, <laughs> he had BT out there that he could like brag about later. So of course yeah. he's gonna take that. And then having John Cena pin Miz after Nikki and Nikki had like gotten sullied. Maurice's dress was like <laughs> bumped into her, and everyone got powdered. <laughs> yeah, literally, she took a powder. <laughs> and Nikki too. She had like a weird. Did you see? It was like right across her eyes. Like yes, she must have landed directly in that. <laughs> and I just love they showed it on. They showed like a, a picture on Facebook of Maurice completely covered. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I think that that they're getting very good at 
telling the story, telling stories in the ring, but having them both be obvious in what they're doing and not obvious. And the fact that it's like telegraphed, but not like, if you know, the rumors, you can see it coming, but if not, you're like, Oh, that's cool. How they did it. And now they're going to fight. Like it's you don't have the logical, yes. which is missing from too much wrestling. Not even just WWE. It's just missing from too much wrestling. Yeah. It, um, yeah, I, I thought it was, like we said, uh, it was a good show. It was not a great show. It was probably the worst SmackDown pay-per-view, but that's not bad. It was just like a B, B minus, not like an A or A minus. That plus the episode that followed were, re- I feel like, really good launch point for Road to WrestleMania for them. Yeah, I think both episodes, um, and the, uh, the both episodes of uh, WWE television, I'm not counting 205 Live, sorry people. <laughs> were really, really good. I thought this was maybe the second best Raw since the brand split. I thought the first time Sasha beat Charlotte was probably the best overall because it just, like, that entire show was just good from top to bottom. And so is this one. I really liked what they did with Braun Strowman and Roman. I didn't love that they almost had Roman beat the tag team champions, (laughs) but... I do like that they immediately, like, once it felt like Roman had a chance, were like, no, screw this. We're just going to beat the crap out of this guy. Well, it makes sense in the, like, neither of Carl Anderson or Luke Gallows is going to beat Roman Reigns one-on-one. And a tag, ma- a tag match is, if you're not taking it, like, if if that guy is in charge of the match, your advantage of being, a tag, being able to tag out is gone. Because you can't tag out. You're getting the shit beat out of you. Yeah. So, like, that is fine. I, but, yes, it's great that it didn't turn into, like, Roman beating both of them. It's just them going, wait a minute, we're bad guys. <laughs> and then just double ba- teaming them. Yeah, we're bad guys, and we don't like this guy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that was good. And it was really good to have uh, Gallows and Anderson just be Gallows and Anderson on the mic with somebody who matters. And not just, like, talking to the New Day who don't take them seriously. Yeah. Like, who are just like, shut shut up. Just shut up, we hate you. Like, Roman Reigns feels the same way, and I actually think he mouths like, I wish these dudes would shut up. <laughs> uh, Roman did a really good job this week, actually. They are cutting his promos down to a couple of words, and it's so much better. I just want words and I stairs. That's all. Yeah. I, you didn't hear me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I really liked Raw this week. Um, I don't think think there was a really bad segment but that segment and the Braun Strowman stuff really for me outside of the like the best segment of all time and a really great main event were uh just two real highlights for me because Braun Strowman just looked awesome all night yeah man Braun is Braun really has Roman Reigns number like he's the guy who is essentially immune to the like long-lasting effects of the Superman punch like, you're going to take him down, but you might have to spam them forever for it to have any real long-lasting effect on Braun. And apparently, he can reverse a spear into a running power slam. So, yeah. <laughs> good luck with that, Roman. And it, he looks De- legit when he beats the crap out of Roman. And I thought the Henry match that Braun had was... It was so much fun to see them just wrestle an old-school, like, old lion, young lion kind of match. Yeah. Where he just... Yeah, it was, and it was a great Mark. Mark Henry is such a bench. He made Braun look so good. Braun picking up Mark Henry and slamming him down is one of those things where you're like, oh, he can do that. After drop <laughs> kicking him. Yeah. So here's a question. What is the chance, percent chance, that there is an actual finish to Roman Reigns versus Braun Strowman at Fastlane? Like, it's 10%. A hundred and thirty-two percent. No, that's not a option. But I'm saying it's so definitely going to happen. It's going to bend space and time because <laughs> Roman Reigns is winning that match. I'm pretty sure Undertaker's going to show up. Oh and man, maybe... I didn't even think of that. And they can have a triple threat. How much fun would that be? No, the Undertaker <laughs> Undertaker will show up, fuck up the match for Roman. Essentially, be like, "Hey, thanks for uh, tossing me out of the Rumble, asshole." You dick. And then, you know, Braun still gets to look, Braun still gets to go into Mania, ready to do whatever it is he's going to do. Because uh, it, it's, it's too early for Braun Strowman to lose to Roman Reigns. 
you know, or to anyone really. Like Braun still has a lot of I have to destroy everyone left to do. Right, right down the date and time that you said that. <laughs> I'm just saying it's too early. I'd like they can make whatever decision they want. I will just criticize it. Oh, okay. You're uh, not saying they won't. You're yeah. saying they shouldn't they under should. any circumstance. So yeah, it's too early. Like let Braun lose at another time um, because he has to win something first, you know. He's also a weird guy that has a very high approval rating around from pretty much everybody. Mm -hmm. Not even in the sense that like everybody cheers for him, but in the sense that like even the smarkiest smarks are kind of like Braun Strowman's pretty good. Yeah. Like, uh, Cage Side Seats does a really, really, really great article series, which is uh, no ne negativity allowed, is I believe what it's called. Yeah, let's say nice things about. Let's say nice things about exactly, and they I, I checked out the Braun Strowman one, and everybody was like, I really genuinely don't have negative things to say about Braun Strowman. He seems like he's a hardworking guy who gets it and is good in the ring and is fast and big, like. Seems like he's going to be a really good professional wrestler. And that's like everybody I talk to, even people who are super critical of the WWE, are like, Braun Strowman seems pretty okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was, man, he was green when he showed up, but like he is, he's capable of everything they need him to do. He, you can trust him on a mic, you can trust him to crush Which somebody. Which is insane. <laughs> it is insane that he's, he's like, he's not great. But he is very good on the mic, and for what he needs to be on the mic, he is like Lawrence Olivier. <laughs> I am multitasking. <laughs> yeah, I think Taker shows up and screws up that finish, and and that's fine because you know it's a pay per view before the biggest pay per view. It's okay to have like a shitty finish that leads to something else, especially if the something else is Roman Reigns versus Undertaker. I'm gonna have a controversial hot take. Ugh. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm fine with everything other than the four major pay-per-views not having good finishes because I pay ten dollars a month for the. No, no don't encourage. I don't. No, don't encourage that. There's already. Well, I I don't think they're going to listen to this and be like, you know what? <laughs> They'll use it as evidence of their worldview. <laughs> uh, it's well, I don't expect. I would like to see, and if I saw it every single month, they give us a bullshit finish. I would start to feel differently, but I do not get up in arms or even particularly bothered by non finishes at pay per views that aren't the big four or five. Like if this happened at the if they did a double DQ finish at like SummerSlam in the main event, I'd be like, really? But if they do it at like Night of Champions, I'm like, well, that's what Night of Champions is for. Yeah, yeah, it's. As long as it moves things along and it adds to the, like adds a layer to the story, because not every feud needs to be wrapped up by the time the pay per view, the next pay per view rolls around. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, there's and also like clearly this Nikki Bella and Natalia thing is going to be wrapped next week when they have this match, and I'm okay with having something uh, to look forward to on the weekly television program that I watch. Like you can wrap up some stuff in between, make people watch those shows. It doesn't lessen the value of the pay-per-views as long as you still put stuff on them that's worth watching. And also just, for me, in terms of value for pay-per-views, I already get a lot of, and this is just me, I'm not speaking for everybody that has a WWE network, I get a lot of value from the archives. So like, I don't have as high expectations, like if I were spending still spending 50 to 70 to $100 a month on pay-per-views, I would be singing a completely different tune. But I kind of have like, I appreciate any effort. I know this sounds terrible. I appreciate the genuine effort. I should say not any effort, but they seem to put genuine effort into the shows in a way that they didn't. When you go back and watch like the years they had 16 and it was like the, the original brand split. It was, it wasn't, there's a lot more being put out quality being put out during these pay-per-views that I don't really need closure. I need a good match. Yeah. I, to a degree. I'm still investing time, even if the money's lower, so, you know, you can abuse any of these in, in any direction, but... Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm, I would, I'm investing time no matter what. <laughs> they, could, fine, they could punch me in the face, and I'd be like, you know what? Good show. <laughs> I'm fine with a non-finish at Fastlane between these two, anyway. Oh, um, I, now that you say it, I hope there is a non-finish, and there, your reasoning totally makes sense, and the reason it would happen totally makes sense. Glad uh, that we cleared that. Uh, and solve that problem. <laughs> what uh, else happened on uh, perhaps the greatest segment of all time? 
it was pretty it's pretty good i i liked it a lot i've I, i'm doing a lot of plugging of cage side today uh gino the general of cage side had a great article which broke down uh in critical theory it's called like a close reading he did a very close reading of the festival of friendship segment where he goes basically uh he does like a TikTok of what happens and there are genuine moments where you're watching that and you're like is kevin owens like working things out in his head and then it crescendos to what it crescendoed to and you're like yep yep the entire time he's trying to figure out whether or not he was going to kill chris jericho yeah you could see you could see it like when he was talking about the minimalist maximist art piece from guggenheim there and he's spent seven thousand dollars on <laughs> and you can see Kevin Owens wants to like yell at him for wasting it because it's like shitty and nonsensical. But also because he knows what he's. I feel like there's like a genuine amount of like real. I don't know if pathos is the right word, but like he feels genuine pity for Chris Jericho because, and I think that's what makes him talking to Triple H interesting, is that you you are trying to determine whether or not he's pissed that he has he's upset that he has to do it or that he was thinking of doing it and this makes it so triple h has is like you have to do this and he's trying to figure out a way to like minimalize the impact and then they go through the maximalist minimalist thing and he's like he's like man i really appreciate that there's they did the like i'm really talking to you bro voice during this segment a lot which i thought was good where they were like you could almost get the feeling they were really saying these things to each other uh as people <laughs> like, Oh, we're going to break up this thing. That was a lot of fun for us to do. But I, I think they go from the maximalist minimalist and then they go to the painting of the creation of Kevin, which by the way is poorly named because Jericho is in the man position. Wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> and you don't have to wear pants. It's art is, I think the motto for wrestling going forward. is you have to wear It's art. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's, there's just that moment, the moment where Owen switches from feeling bad about having to kick Jericho's ass to wanting to kick Jericho's ass was clearly... Which is when Gilbert... Yeah, when Gilbert shows up, because then Owen's is like, you aren't taking this seriously. You set me up in this match with Goldberg, and I feel like I'm going to get my ass kicked, and or there's a possibility I'm going to get my ass kicked, and it'll be your fault, and all you can do is bring out this weird little man... And then pretend it's Goldberg. And that's not going to protect my title. And then that was like, that's the moment when it became much easier for Kevin Owens to just be like, you know what I'm good at? Fucking over people who are my friends. Yeah, killing people. He murderized Chris Jericho. There (laughs) is like a, the way he punches when he's angry in character is just different. He like clenches a lot more. And you notice like that, Although his, like, he's not classically built like a WWE professional wrestler. He is as big and strong as any of the guys they've ever had before. And he's just wailing on Chris Jericho. And I was like, that's the Kevin Owens we know and love. Ah, poor Jericho. It's his... <laughs> gets the list. It's... Why? Why is my name on this one? Don hits, and then Kevin Owens hits. Yeah, uh, that was, it, it was so just... Good. Perfect. God, what a great... It was genuinely great. Like, people... I Because I, I tried to watch, but there was something wrong with the app I was trying to watch it on, so I just watched it the next day on Hulu. So, like, I had heard everything about this segment. I was like, oh, it'll probably be pretty good. And I was watching it, and it's one of the best, like, executed segments. I, like, that was a classic segment to watch in real time, because it's it's a perfect Chris Jericho segment and a perfect Chris, uh, Chris, Ke- Kevin Owen segment. Like it gets both of their like entire personalities perfectly. You know, it would be kind of amazing. I can't tell if this would retroactively harm this segment or make it even better, but you know how every time Jericho and Owens have like hinted at a breakup and then it's turned out that they were in cahoots. How funny would it be if Jericho was off TV until Fastlane and then held Kevin Owens beat Goldberg? I thought the exact same thing. That (laughs) would be like, like, what the fuck, guys? Yeah, that would be like, 
a really genuinely great i thought that i was like i really kind of hope that's the case and then have them finally just be like no i was using this entire time so i could get a match with you at wrestlemania you idiot Ugh. Uh, yeah i and it was and that was the crown uh, maybe not the crown jewel actually now that i think about it but it was it was a really great segment in what was to that point a very very good raw and then the main event of raw like that was that was real good and i'm very happy and i may or may not have like jumped up and clapped when bailey beat charlotte for the title such a better match than their royal rumble match oh my Uh, god yeah which man uh it's good to see you know bailey's great and bailey's gotten so much better since she showed up in nxt um i think a thing that's going to kind of dog her throughout her career is that not only was she the last of the four horsewomen but her character is better than her ring work. Though I will say this: this match was, I think, the best I've seen Bailey since the like so- the heydays of her and Sasha's feud. Yeah, like she looked like she had caught up to the speed in the way that you in college athletes have trouble catching up to the speed of the professional game. It kind of felt like this was the first time she was actually working at the same speed Charlotte was. Because the thing with Charlotte is that woman just goes and goes and goes like she goes she is her father's daughter in terms of that just like a relentless and it's all car and she has just the best conditioning out of anybody she's working with and she just ran all match and this was the first time belly felt like she could catch keep up with her both in a kayfabe and in a real sense yeah and i didn't mean to discredit bailey there before you made it sound like i did by cutting in with your no. salient points but, You're uh, a hater. <laughs> no, she's great. Um, being the, air quotes here, the weakest of the four horsewomen is a pretty good place to be because, dude, they're all awesome. Like, if you're the worst of a group of dope-as-fuck wrestlers, guess what? You're still a dope-as-fuck wrestler. Uh, it's just, but the, like, that's gonna, I feel like that's a thing that's gonna dog her. You could see it happen after the Charlotte match at uh, the Rumble when it was just okay. You could see people being like, I don't remember, Bailey's kind of the weakest worker of the four, you know? But the we, best, I feel like the best, most... The best character, so yeah. beloved, super over, but, like, the weakest on an actual performance level. Which I don't, I don't even know if that's true, because you look at, like, the magic she pulled with Eva Marie and with Nia Jax very early in her career, and the Asuka matches were really good. Not that Asuka needed the help, but, you know... She's she can in uh, she's capable of helping like lifting people up to her level, which not everyone does. Uh, as much as we love Chris Jericho, uh, I think Jericho's at his best when he is facing someone who's better than he is, uh, because like he ups his game. If he's the best wrestler in a match, sometimes there are issues. Um, Bailey's not one of those kinds of wrestlers. Like she ha- she brings her a game all the time. Um, and just, you know, sometimes matches don't click even when everyone's great. And I think that's what happened at Royal Rumble. And it was, it was shorter than it should have been because they were trying to tell this different story. Um, but this like, now that they've moved it to Bailey being more intense and willing to do things that are going to like hurt Charlotte and not just keep her down for three, like that neck breaker through the ropes, that thing was brutal looking. And that's the kind of thing you're going to have to do if you're facing Charlotte. Like it doesn't make you a bad person, Bailey. This is Charlotte. She will literally kill you if it means she gets to keep her title. And she won't feel bad about it for a second. It's funny, your description of her is so John Cena, it's not even funny. It's like, she's not the best worker, but she's really good at pulling up people below her to make them seem like a big deal. And... She's. It's gonna dog her in her career. She's not the best worker of this like group of work. Like it's very. She's so John Cena. <laughs> it's. I mean, the, she should be. the The women's division could use a John Cena. Um, yeah. So uh, let, it, let her be. Yeah. No. And I, I. I. I meant that in the most positive possible. Oh yeah. She and and the idea that she this does. She goes. Cena podcast. So. Yeah. She goes every single night as hard as she can. Like. Yeah. That's the other thing with her is very Cena esque, and and this match, uh, from beginning to end was just like really, really well worked, and I can't say it enough. Charlotte is just so great. Like she she did a frigging moonsault off of the. She did it off of the the. Oh my god, I'm blanking the, the railing. Off barricade. The bar- off, the, off the barricade. Like she did it off the barricade in front of which Bryce is Harper. Ins- which is insane. 
Bryce Harper's handsome face was in front of her, and she was able to keep her cool and hit a tight moonsault that almost decapitated Bailey. Which, by the way, I'm very excited about because Charlotte always has a beautiful moonsault, but too often the moonsault hits somebody in the arm. And that's because the wrestler's like, wow, Charlotte is much bigger than me, and I don't want to be hit. Like, Sasha Banks, I'm talking about you as much as I love you. Yeah, and that's um, something I noticed about Bailey that I also enjoyed, is Bailey's, Bailey's also much closer in size to Charlotte. It doesn't look like she's throwing around a child, which is kind of what it can look like with Charlotte and Sasha. Yeah, man, this is good. This is good that Bailey's like on that level. I love Sasha's involvement, too. Um, Dana Brooke showed back up. Great. Um, and now Sasha got involved, inserted herself, and not for no reason, too. Charlotte ran her down before the match. Now Bailey's in this position where she doesn't know that she got an assist, but also the assist was okay because Dana Brooke cheated first, and the only reason the figure eight was even applied was because Bailey had been eye raked. So there's all these like interlocking layers of Bailey still might be like, well, you didn't let me fight my battle. I still could have handled this on my own or whatever. Um, doesn't like getting that assist. Because it still feels, you know, Bailey's fighting to prove that she belongs, and now Charlotte can use this against her, whether it's right or not. So this will be this will be really good going forward. And as we talked this, that I talked about earlier, that's probably where Stephanie will come in is just being like, oh, you're not actually champion, so that they can have her win the championship back at WrestleMania or something like that. Is my assumption, <sighs> or at least you, I, it's like probably set up something in Fastlane. If they do it that way, where they're just like, okay, well, then you clearly deserve some sort of. Like, not champion's advantage, but, like, we are going to make your life easier, but only do it at fast lane. I think that's the best way to do it, and not do a full-blown, like, oh, it's Charlotte's title. It's like, well, the match is over. I, I don't like when they do that, because it cheapens the championship win in a way that feels like... I don't like the dusty finish part where they take the title back. I know that sounds yeah. really stupid. If you're going to do I it, feel- you have to do it shortly after, too. Like, that should have yeah. happened the same episode. Yes, exactly. If they at the end of the thing, you Stephanie comes out and is like, "You, well, you cheated. That's like not your title." But they've already done that, so I, like, I, I feel like they have to tread carefully. And I just don't. My chief concern is my only concern is not like a four way between her Nia, uh, between Bailey, Nia, Charlotte, and Sasha. It's nothing like a triple threat. Those would all be great. It's that Stephanie McMahon is going to make this the Stephanie McMahon show. Well, shit. <laughs> Let's think of a way where it won't be that. Um, I think as long as it's, or if it's just Charlotte is Stephanie's like charge, you know what I'm saying? Like in her place, uh, that would be fine. But they can't have it where she's like making Bailey's life miserable and not using a, a conduit or like a like a proxy. That's what I was looking for. A, a proxy that can then get their comeuppance for both of the both Charlotte and Stephanie would have to get comeuppance. Like Ugh, I Stephanie don't want it. Yeah, and that's the thing is I don't want Stephanie to be like the <laughs> the cool girl character where she gets to like play both sides because she also hates Charlotte for being rude to her dad. It's God damn it, Stephanie, you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, deep breath. We're gonna move on from Stephanie. I have a thought about how you can do this to screw Bailey out of the title so that she wins back again at Mania. You set up a no DQ match as, you know, because people interfered. Now you either, you set up some kind of no DQ situation, which would favor the heels more because, Oh, I have an idea. Hell in a cell match. (laughs) Historic second time. (laughs) Um, You do a no DQ, which lets, you know, Dana comes out and does her thing. And then Sasha comes up to stop Dana, but you have miscommunication that has Sasha, hurt like hurt Bailey's chances of winning keeps her from winning or you have Sasha just straight up like turn on her because she's not done with Charlotte and she wants to be involved in the mania main event it is isn't inserting herself you know you've got other ways to do it but I feel like a situation where you allow Sasha Banks to be there without the match being thrown out immediately is a good way to do it yeah all right I feel better um did you have anything else you wanted to talk about this week or hmm. no I think uh, I think that should. I think we covered it. literally every single thing that happened. No, we didn't. But don't tell the listeners that. Oh, mm. I, I will actually leave it with this one s- statement. Uh, if you haven't seen the Samoa Joe interview with Michael Cole, oh, yeah, it's really good. Go watch it. It it's much better. It's not going to be interesting for us to talk about, but it is a holy shit good interview. 
what we can talk about that is interesting from it is just that Joe makes it clear that he's not like all the other Triple H people who have been brought up. And that will be fascinating someday when there's a break. Because yeah. Joe, from the outset, is saying, oh no, I just like getting... I I'm just not like Triple H's the, boy. Yeah, I just <laughs> like getting paid by the authority and doing what they say because it works for me. I can do that. I could do this on my own if I felt like it. It's just my suits are much nicer this way. Yep. It's really... Uh, it's... And it's short, pretty short too. So it's totally where you can find it on YouTube. I that is the best segment to watch if you only have like three minutes because the match and the Jericho segment are both longer. But that is like a great segment. Uh, all right, so uh, Mark, where can they find you on the internet? On Twitter at uh, Mark underscore Normandin. That's Mark with a C. You can read me at Cage Side Seats every morning with Rude Awakening. Uh, which is still a newsletter in progress, but it shows up on the site uh, every morning at about 10.15 a.m. Um, you can find my uh, my other wrestling writing at espionation.com slash wrestling, just not for, uh, probably not again until Fastlane because I am on paternity leave and uh, I'm not doing it. Uh, you can find me at the Nixter on the Twitter. It's a T-H-E-N-1-C-K-S-T-E-R. That is the eight millionth time I've gotten that right, so go me. Uh, you can check us out at soundcloud.com slash Rudo Radio. That's R-U-D-O-R-A-D-I-O. And you can rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. Mark, do you have a review this week? I do. Um, this podcast really makes us feel the glow, or makes me feel the glow. Unless you listen to the group, then I don't know, do us. That's It's up to you and your listening habits. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Uh, congratulations, Naomi. Congratulations, well, Bray. It was a jumbled mess, but I appreciate I appreciate you saying that. It was good. Yeah, I'm, pr I'm proud of you. Thank you. You gave me the WWE video package treatment where you cleaned up everything, and now it just looks pretty tidy. <laughs> uh, and I guess if there's nothing left to say, the only thing left to say is bye! Bye! <laughs>